Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. I'm Brian Sanders. Please go back, start at the beginning. So many good episodes, like I always say. Please share with family and friends. Please support the Food Lies docu-series. We're so close to getting the first episode done and showing it around, pitching around to Netflix, streaming platforms, celebrities, whoever we need to to get this thing out to the world. So if you're not familiar with who I am, I'm making the Food Lies series for the past six years. I started nosetotail.org, a regenerative meat company and body care company, and we get great products out to people. And I run the Sapien Center here in Austin, and I do this podcast basically all around this ancestral health topic, letting people know the real information on how to be healthy. This is all I do, and it's so fun. I'm glad to be doing this podcast, spreading the good word, spreading the good meat out to people in the U.S. at least and living this lifestyle here in Austin with my good people at the Sapien Center. So today, I'm talking to one of my pals here in Austin, Kyle Lasota. He is Kyle Got Camera on YouTube. He is a sleep guru. He is the man at getting sleep. He puts his money where his mouth is and has the best sleep scores in the game. He gets the most deep sleep and the most REM sleep out of anyone I've ever seen. That's why I wanted to talk to him today to get the actionable insights What can you actually do to get better sleep? Not just theoretical. This guy is doing it. He's living it. And I've learned from him. And now you can learn from him. So this is a great episode on how to actually put these practices into your life. Get your circadian rhythm down. Get that good sleep. Get the restorative sleep that will help you not get Alzheimer's, not get chronic diseases. Help your brain repair itself help you feel rested, maybe even not need coffee anymore because you feel so good. So that's what this episode is all about. He made a whole course on this. You can click the link in the show notes to get first access to this course and his special deal of answering your questions personally. So just click that link in the show notes. And I hope you enjoy this one. It's a fun one. I'm telling you, sleep is so important. Right after food, they go side by side. It's what you eat and good restorative sleep. That's how you have good health. Of course, there's other factors, but I think these are the biggest. So enjoy this one with Kyle. Kyle, man, how's it going? Good. Good to be here. Yeah, it's funny because we're in Austin, but we're in separate rooms. We almost did in person, but I think this is going to be better. We have our focus. We have our just little studios, one man studios. And we're going to get into some great stuff today. Kyle has been a friend of mine for a couple years. He's been doing the real deal. I guess you could call it biohacking, sleep hacking, so many different things. But he's the guy that does it in person or takes these things, does them in real life and gets the real results. You know, there's a lot of people I have on the show that might be PhDs and they're great and they have great credentials. And they're all theoretical, right? And they're just sitting there in the classroom. Kyle's the one that actually does it. He's also kind of like me in that I'm trying to get all the best information and get it out to the world in a good format that's easy to understand and implement with food, right? My nutrition, food lies, all that, the podcast. So Kyle's doing that mainly around sleep. So Kyle, tell us more about yourself. Yeah, so... I suppose it's always best to start with like why, you know, why sleep and why did I even get into this? And it started off like in my early 20s, I started struggling with some health issues. I was having anxiety. I was having gut issues. I was having skin problems and panic attacks. And uh, I didn't know why. So I started going to a bunch of different doctors and started to try to figure out what was going on. And I it pains me to say it, but it took me four and a half years to figure it out. And in that time period of four and a half years, I was trying everything I could underneath the sun um, to figure out why I was feeling the way that I was feeling. What it came down to is that I was living in a house that had mold and I had gotten a mold infection and my immune system was really low. And um, I was just you know, off the charts with an aspergillus uh, mold infection. And thankfully, a, a very skilled health coach gave me the right tests. And once I figured that out, I cleared the mold infection. I felt like, wow, like this is a whole new life. Um, but 
I spent about one hundred fifty thousand dollars in over the course of those couple of years trying to figure out that, and I tried a lot of stuff that didn't work, and I tried a lot of stuff that kind of made things better, and um, things kind of came to a crux when I was in this mastermind, a business mastermind with a bunch of other entrepreneurs. And um, the guy running the mastermind said to me, he said, Kyle, if you can't wake up and go to bed at the same time every day, how could you ever expect to do anything great in this world? And I w- at the time, I was trying all this crazy biohacking stuff to try to feel better. And when he said that to me, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, wow, like that's so simple yet so true. I'm going to stop trying to do all this crazy stuff and I'm just going to get really focused on um, the fundamentals. And and the first one was sleep. That's the foundation by which everything else is built on. And I intuitively knew that made perfect logical sense to me. Um, And so I bought an aura ring. And then once I got an aura ring, then I started to see the data. I started to see uh, what was happening because I was sleeping eight to nine hours a night, but I was waking up feeling exhausted. And I started to learn, you know, as you do when you start going down this health journey, I started to consume lots of content. And um, that health coach that I was working with, he told me about the circadian rhythm. And I started to implement immediately what he was telling me because I was feeling so bad. And I was very militant and religious with his instructions. And I just did whatever he said. And it, it started to get a lot better. And I my scores on my aura ring and, and how I felt were increasing like significantly. So I was like, I think there's something here. So I just kept doing it. I kept experimenting. I paid very close attention to what worked and what didn't work. And I used the aura ring uh, data as a very tight feedback loop. So anything, I, anytime I would do something, I would see results. And then I would make a note of that. Or it would throw it off and I would make a note of that. And I would just collect this huge pool of data over time uh, until I started to get perfect sleep. And what I mean by perfect sleep is I was averaging between three hours plus a night of deep sleep, 90 minutes to two hours of REM sleep. I was sleeping completely undisturbed and my HRV was increasing my heart rate variability, which is a measurement of stress and recovery. And um, and I, I just realized that that this was really exciting. And I started to share what was happening online and just you know, like excited about what I what I was experiencing, and people started to go crazy. And I was like, "Wow, I think I think there's something here beyond just my situation." But I think a lot of people are really struggling with this because all of a sudden I had everyone and their mom asking me for help. Hey, how are you doing this? What do I need to do to change? And and it just became this evolution of me just like starting to help people with sleep, and that's kind of what springboarded me in this direction, I suppose. I love it. Yeah, I think I was one of those people and I saw your Instagram posts and you're like, holy smokes, how do you get this good sleep, this quality sleep? I actually did my last podcast on that with Dr. Gorman that helps widen your palate so you can breathe out of your nose better. Mm. Like I've had a bad nose my whole life. I broke my nose a few times. I think I have deviated septum. I just can never breathe through my nose well. So I'm working on that and it's going to take years to like really fix that problem. But I was always wanting to fix my sleep. And I've talked about before, I told you, I take my sleep so seriously. I get eight hours of sleep, about 360 nights per year. Like I am about it. The the thing is, even more than my food, I'm more consistent. Obviously, I'm obsessed with the food stuff, but I'm more consistent with the sleep. Hmm. Because when I travel, you know, some things happen. It's like, ah, okay. But when I travel, I'm like, I'm still going to get my eight hours of sleep. But it wasn't always the best sleep. It's not full recuperative sleep. Like I don't have an aura ring, but I use one of these kind of fake rings that someone gave me. And yeah, I was not getting the deep sleep and the REM sleep that I wanted. Hey everyone, just gotta jump in here and talk about nosetail.org. This is my company that I do with my regenerative ranching friends. These families are great. They do the best job. They do all the good practices to get the good meat to you. Go to nosetail.org make a box, get it shipped straight to your door, 48 states, or get the body care products, also made with regeneratively raised beef tallow. This is the good stuff. This has no fake scents, just essential oils, a bit of coconut oil, some avocado oil to go along with the beef tallow to get the consistency and texture right. And this stuff is magical, telling you everyone loves it. Everyone who uses it goes nuts. We have hair product, 
We have hair holds with beeswax. If you want to style your hair, we've got leave-in conditioner. we got deodorant. we got soap. we got skin food. If you get a little too much sun, put that skin food on. Oh, man, it'll take care of it. Turn it into a tan. I just put some on today because I was out in the sun a little too much. So get that skin food. Get all the other body care stuff and the biltong. Get that dried meat with no additives, no sugar, no curing agents. All at nosetail.org. Thanks for supporting us. We're a small business just doing the best we can, getting out the good products without all the funny stuff in it. So thanks, everyone. So just to re- reiterate again, Kyle is one of the like most advanced sleep experts that is living it and <laughs> doing it, the living proof of it. You know, I see people who are, quote, sleep experts. They're not getting as good sleep as him. That's why I wanted to have you on and share these insights with people. By the end of the show, I'm sure people will get tons of useful information and they'll be able to use it in their daily lives. But this is like the proof is in the pudding. You get the good sleep. This is like my controversial post of I had the obese nutritionist. And I said, would you take advice from this woman? And there was a thousand comments saying, no, no, no. At some mm-hmm. point, you need you could have all the theoretical knowledge in the world, but you need to do it. So Kyle's doing it. So how do you start people off? Where do, where do we start here? Yeah, I, I think the best place to start is usually not the place that people think. The best place to start is the moment that you wake up, right? So your sleep is really dictated mostly by what you do in the previous day. And so if you start the day the wrong way, that could set you up for a bad night's sleep. But if you start the day the right way, then that could set you up for a great night's sleep. So the first pillar that if is really the 80-20, if everyone just focused on this, it would change everything for them. And it's exactly what changed everything for me, which is to focus on the circadian rhythm and mastering the fundamentals that influence the circadian rhythm so that you can have a healthy night's sleep. And circadian rhythm is just this thing inside of our body. It's like your controls your sleep and wake cycle. So when you go to bed, when you wake up, and it's really dictated and managed by a handful of chemicals, but ma- the majority of it, the, mo- the most of it is being influenced by cortisol and melatonin. And there's th- these three pillars that I focus on when it comes to the circadian rhythm that make the biggest difference. When, I, when there's that quote, it's like small hinges swing big doors. This is the small hinge. And those first three pillars are light exposure, movement, and your feed fast window and or uh, meal timing. So when I mean starting your day the right way, I mean getting up and going outside within the first hour of waking up and going for a 20 to 30 minute walk. Why is this so important? When you go for that 20 minute morning walk and you expose your body to some sunlight, that's going to activate the healthy release of cortisol and it's going to modulate the healthy release of melatonin in the evening that night. The other thing that's going to happen is it's going to downregulate a part of your brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is responsible for making you feel stressed, fearful, and anxious, right? So as you see images pass by your eyes, there's this mechanism, I guess, in your brain called optic flow. And optic flow happens when that thing in the distance comes closer and then passes. For whatever reason, that downregulates that part of your brain that makes you scared and fearful. And so you're going to be way less stressed throughout the day and into the evening. And everyone knows if you're stressed and if you're dealing with anxiety, then it's going to be hard to fall asleep. So those two reasons right there. The third reason why this morning walk is so important is because it's going to bring your blood sugar down. Okay. And it's going to actually set your blood sugar for the rest of the day. And your blood sugar is closely tied to the quality of your sleep. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. That's three. The fourth thing is when you walk, you're stimulating these chemicals in your belly, in your stomach, one called ghrelin, right? Which is going to help you get get you ready to digest your first meal. And then it's also going to increase bile production by 200%. So What's happening here is when we go for this morning walk, we're hitting all these triggers that are basically setting us up to have a really, really good day. And because gut health and sleep 
there's a bi-directional relationship as well, as well as with blood sugar, then you're kind of like, you're doing the heavy lifting with this first little activity. And if, if all you left with at the end of this podcast was just to go for that 20 or 30 morning walk within the first hour of waking up, it would completely change your life <laughs> and your sleep for the better. And it can be that simple. And that's, that's something I want to put a pin in because I think it's overlooked and it's almost like scoffed at. And something I've been experiencing, Brian, I would love your, your thoughts on this is, you know, as I've been sharing more and more and helping people, what I realize is that the, the deepest truths are usually really simple. And sometimes people have a hard time grasping that it could really be that easy and that simple. Mm. Yeah, I think that's like a weird cognitive dissonance type thing with humans where we we don't believe that. Or maybe it's, I think it's because so many things have been marketed to us over our lifetimes. It's like the infomercial, hey, just do this and it's just twenty four ninety nine, or just do this one thing. That's been pounded in and 99% of the time it's bogus. And so when someone does come with the simple trick, no one believes it. It's a boy who cried wolf. <laughs> And that's it. That's it. Actually, that's completely it. So I get it. And two, why this works and why it's so simple is back to my whole foundation of beliefs is on ancestral health and that what did our ancestors do? And we can't know exactly, but likely they got up. Well, they they had they kind of had these normal sleep cycles. They probably went to sleep at the same time and woke up at the same time because it's just, well, it got dark. They hung out for three hours and they went to sleep and they woke up when it got light. And then they, uh, well, let's go like get some food or let's go visit our friends or let's go do something. Let's walk. Let's be in nature. Let's be in the sun. And then let's eat something. It's not like they just woke up and grabbed a pop tart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, I just want to like, yeah, just put some, a spotlight on that because it's so powerful. Like, you know, I just shared all those different benefits that happen by nature of going through this 20, 30 minute walk. And it's not to be underestimated, you know? And so I just want to let that land for people before I move on. Um, and the second pillar that influences the circadian rhythm that I that I focus on and talk about is going to be your movement, okay? So we're actually hitting that second pillar with that morning walk as well, right? So that's a trigger. It's called a, um, uh, what, it, what is it called? It, it's basically just a biological trigger that, that, says, hey, this is what time of day it is, you know, and and you should be doing this type of activity at this time. And if you train or you work out, which I'm assuming you do or you're trying to do if you listen to this podcast, then if you can time your workout or your movement activity at the same time beyond just the morning walk. So if you work out at, you know, midday or if you work out like at 4 p.m. or whatever whatever time you, you choose to work out, try to make that as consistent as possible. And if you're not super into working out yet, or um, what do you do on the off days? I love to go for walks after my meals. So I'll go for a 20 minute walk after I eat lunch, or I go for a 20 minute walk after I eat dinner. You're hitting kind of like a double whammy here because when you go for that walk after your meal, it's also going to bring down your blood sugar and it's going to help you absorb the nutrients from your food. So it'll help you digest that food better. And so you actually get more nutrition from the food that you're eating, hopefully the sapient food that <laughs> Brian endorses. And and so you're hitting, again, more than one lever with just these simple activities of going for these walks after your meals, which ties in perfectly to the third pillar, which is meal timing or feed fast window. So if you're going to fast, just make sure you have your first meal at the same time and then you have your next meal at the same time. And if you don't fast, then just have breakfast, lunch, and dinner or breakfast, lunch, and dinner, snack, or breakfast, excuse me, breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, whatever your eating schedule is, just try to make it as consistent as possible. So for me, I eat at nine, I eat at 12 noon, and I eat around 5.30 to 6.30. And I'm not perfect. I'm not a machine. Mm -hmm. I just do my best to stay within an hour of my designated eating time. And that is, is basically telling my body, produce these chemicals and produce these hormones and 
send all of these biological signals to, to basically do this thing at the same time. Your body loves to be in, in a rhythm. And the reason why the circadian rhythm is so powerful is because every single cell in your body has an internal clock inside of it. And so if you can entrain all of these rhythms in your cells to be working at the same time, then your body becomes very efficient and very good at what it's supposed to do, a, aka produce hormones and secrete the right enzymes and the right chemicals, uh, neurotransmitters, all that stuff. So just to recap, we have that morning walk, right? For the light exposure, then we have a meal timing, and then we have the movement. And when you do all those three things, really nailing the circadian rhythm. And for the light exposure in the evening, if you go for that post-dinner walk, you're also seeing the sun set on the horizon, which is naturally going to tell your bed, hey, it's, it might be time to start winding down a little bit, sort of down-regulating. And then your body is going to start to up-regulate melatonin, which will help you get ready for sleep. And you want to hack your house, then you can you know, install Philips Hue light bulbs like I have right here that will change. So that's an automation that I've set up. It changes to red at 8.30. Or you can do candles or you can just dim the lights. But ideally, you don't want to expose yourself to too much blue light in the evening because that just stimulates you, wakes you up, makes you feel like, hey, it's it's daytime. And that's not normal. Our bodies aren't supposed to experience quote unquote daytime in the evening. So that's how I think about the circadian rhythm. And if and that's really the 80-20 of, of this all is if you can just be consistent with those things, then your sleep's dramatically going to improve. You're going to, it's going to be easier to fall asleep. You're going to stay asleep for longer and the quality of the sleep you're going to get is going to be better. And you're going to wake up feeling more refreshed. It's great. Now, I love the 80, 20 part. Cause that's what people need to know the most. It's like, okay, I want to get started. Well, give me the 80, 20 and that's it. And yes, then, you know, for the rest of the podcast, we can get into the last 20% and there's tons of hacks and tips and tricks and all that. But I've even tested with myself about the circadian rhythm, how huge it is. It is unbelievable. Like if you're taking example of alcohol, everyone knows that alcohol is not good for you, right? But if you choose to drink alcohol, this is just like a test that I've done. I can have say two drinks at like five, do it like happy hour. You know, I'm like connecting with some people, have a couple of drinks. Then I just get on with my day. I eat and I go to sleep at a normal time. I wake up, I can feel perfect. Mm. If you did a different thing, and it could be the same amount, usually it's not the same amount, you know, if you're staying up late, but say you had two drinks at 1 a.m. and then you went to sleep at 2 a.m., you're going to feel terrible. It's unbelievable how different it is and how bad it is. And it's just something that I've noticed is even without drinking, per se, if I go to sleep at 2 a.m., it's like my three days are ruined, mm. ruined. And sometimes I do having fun. I'm meeting new people, socializing. Sometimes it could be worth it. Maybe, maybe some people, you know, you could talk about that. Like, is it worth yeah. it? Because some people change their whole lifestyle and then they, they always go home early and maybe that's better for them. But how yeah. Do you even, yeah. How do you even? Yeah. Do yeah. Yeah. This is something I've had to work through myself a lot. Um, and I've gone through different seasons and I like to think of life as, as being seasonal. And in some seasons, you might be more socially like bound and you just like, you want to go out more. You want like, if you're single, it's like, like going to bed early is not the vibe, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I, I, I went through that, you know, and like right now I'm in a relationship, but before I felt very deprived when I first started getting into the sleep optimization stuff, I started to feel better, which was great. But then I was like, so restricted, you know, I felt like I was always saying no to everything. And I'm, I'm a social creature. I'm a social being. I love community. It's a huge part of my life. And I decided last year to break all my rules and test my hypothesis that what if, what if I didn't have to be so restrictive and just go to bed early to get good sleep? But what if I was really consistent with my circadian rhythm, but I just pushed it back later? So instead of going to bed at 10 o'clock, you know, I would go to bed at 1130 or sometimes, you know, like really I was, I was skating between 11 and midnight was like the, the rhythm that I was in and I was waking up around seven to eight o'clock, maybe 830. Okay. So a little bit later of a schedule, but I was doing all the things that I just shared. I was doing the light exposure, the meal timing and the movement. And 
my sleep was the same. It was just as good. Now, granted, I don't drink, right? I'm also very active. Like I work out and I have a low stress lifestyle and I set it up that way, you know, on purpose. Um, but I found that if I just stay really consistent with the timing, you know, the and the three pillars, and I make sure that here's the biggest one that we didn't we didn't talk about yet, which is having an early dinner. If I have an early dinner, I'm good. I can get away with a lot more. But then in addition to that, this is the other thing that I teach is I, I talk about building a sleep oasis, okay? And turning your home into an environment that literally induces you into sleep. So when I walk into my house, every single light in my house is red. Then I do a micro routine. Let's say I came b- come back from a party or an event or something like that. I'm going to do a micro wind down routine. And we can talk about wind down routines later, like a, s- a condensed version of it. And I use these as, as triggers like a Pavlonian dog. And that's the third thing that I teach is creating custom sensory anchors. So using your senses to trigger you into it's time to get ready to fall asleep. And so what I do is I would go out, like last year I was going out four to five nights a week, very active social life, very active dating life. And I wanted that. That was what I was optimizing for. And I, but I didn't want to sacrifice my sleep. So I shifted everything back. I, and then when I come home, I walk into this perfect environment and then I do this micro routine that triggers me into that state that's ready to fall asleep. And I was able to fall asleep, you know, within 15 minutes to half an hour of the time that I got home and I was able to stay asleep, get really high quality sleep. So lots of deep sleep, lots of REM sleep and wake up feeling good. And, and that blew me away. And, and that's part of what I'm teaching now is, is learning all these things, right? And using them as frameworks and almost like training training wheels. And then I want to teach you to break all the rules so that you can build sleep resilience. Because that's that's my definition of health is resilience. So if you have to do everything perfect just to have a good night's rest, then that's not very resilient. So I think it's good to push the boundaries and sort of create some intentional stress so that you become more adapted. And it also depends what season of life you're in. You know, if you're in a focus season, if you're trying to grow something, if you're, you know, a business owner, or high performer, you're, you're an athlete, then that stuff might not be as important. You might want to be fully optimized and really dialed in, really routined and ritualed. And there's nothing wrong with that either. It's just like what's important to you. And I want to give people the skill sets to be able to make that choice of I want to, I can either do this way or I can do the other way. And in different seasons of life, I can. I can adapt. You, well, that's great. You want to be anti-fragile. Absolutely. Yes. This is a thing that I've talked to some of the carnivore people about over the years. I'm like if you eat one berry and it's going to screw up your whole life and you're going to be, <laughs> feel sick because you're so carnivore and you can't handle like any fiber or any plant matter, are you healthy? Yeah. I don't think so. I think you're a bit fragile yeah. and I want to be anti-fragile. And and that's a good concept too of of teaching all the tools and then being able to break them because you need to do stuff for life. I'm making these kind of nutrition comparisons in, in my world. Mm-hmm. It's yes, I, I I can do it. You can dial it in, learn it all, get super fit, figure it all out. And then you're like, okay, now how can I make this a lifestyle? How can I adapt it? How can I optimize for my situation? Like you're you're saying is like, yes, if I was a high performing athlete, then I would just be strict all the time. But I'm not. I'm optimizing for an optimal social and business life right now, mm-hmm. right? It's like, mm-hmm. okay, well, I can, you know, eat at someone's house and I don't have to like go insane because <laughs> like I can handle it. Or I just ate at someone's house last night and they actually made a perfect meal with all the right ingredients. You know, <laughs> that's another thing you can optimize for is find people to hang out with that get it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's a that's a big hack. I think that that should not be understated or overlooked because it's very hard to live um, optimally, you know, from a health perspective, if your environment and your surroundings and your community doesn't support that or you. So that's not to be undervalued at all. That's a good point. Yeah, it's huge. And for sleep, for exercise, for food, for everything, 
Well, that's kind of why we have the Sapien Center. <laughs> we're yes. trying to we get everyone around. <laughs> go, get, go get your membership at the Sapien Center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, we shouldn't even talk about it because most people aren't in Austin listening. But yeah, yeah. Uh, move to Austin. <laughs> move to, uh, no, no, we don't need more people here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, okay. So, yes, you're right. Surround yourself with the right people. Okay, let's go into some more of these details, though. So, maybe Sleep Oasis. Let's go there. Cool. Yeah. So building a sleep oasis is just like what it sounds like. Imagine a really nice hotel or imagine a five-star restaurant or a first-class seat. When you walk uh, into that environment, there is an energy that that room or that experience carries. And there's a reason why it feels the way that it feels. And it's because it's been designed to give you that feeling, right? And that's what the people pay for is they pay for, you know, I'm walking into this five-star hotel. I feel rich. I feel mm -hmm. wealthy. I feel- A lot of money has gone into that too. <laughs> yes. A lot of thought, a lot of intention, a lot of money, like all of that has gone into the, the design and the aesthetic and the vibe, the feeling that you get when you enter into that room or, or for that experience. And- that concept, I just, I took that concept and I applied that to the bedroom and to the home specifically for sleep. So a good sleep oasis is cool. It's dark, it's clean, it's safe, and it's relaxing. When you walk in, you're at ease and you're like, wow, this is the place to fall asleep. And it's hilarious because people come to my house all the time. I have people flying in and staying over and all the time and everyone everyone says it to me. They say, I don't know why, but I just sleep so well at your place. And I'm like, yeah, I know why. Cause I set it up that way. Right. So it's like, what can you do to, to give yourself that feeling? And, and this is kind of where some fun and some creativity can come in. Cause you can make it however you want it to be, whatever makes you feel that way. Like if you notice behind me, this is, I'm filming in my bedroom, my sleep oasis, and I have this lamp that turns red. I have this lamp, which is like, also it turns this orange color. I have some house plants right there and there. I have a meditation cushion right there. My red light therapy device, my eight sleep mattress cover, which cools the, the top of the bed. And it's all been designed. I blackout shades. I have a air, HEPA air filter, a uh, really nice one. And all this has been thought about and set up so that I could feel all these things that I want to feel when I put my head down on the pillow so that it makes falling asleep and staying asleep effortless. And I'm, I'm, I'm a lazy guy. Honestly, I am. And, and people, uh, people probably would laugh at that who know me. They say like, you're like one of the most disciplined guys I know, but, but I'm really not. I've just set up some systems to make it really easy to stay consistent. Cause I learned a long time ago that when it comes to sleep, going to bed and waking up at the same time is is probably like overarching the most important thing. And it's like that guy said that whose mastermind I was in. And so I just thought about like, wow, that's sometimes can be very challenging to be consistent. So how can I make it as easy as possible to be consistent? So I don't I don't have to I don't have to worry about choice. I don't have to make decisions when my willpower is the lowest. I've just created an environment and a system that takes care of me. Mm. This, this is something I talked about last night at this dinner I was at about you don't want to be able to use willpower. Apparently, there's a whole book about there is no willpower. I forget what it's called. If you have to use willpower, it's not going to work. This is my big problem with standard diet advice is they're telling people to just cut calories and like that's never going to work. You're just relying on willpower and white knuckling it through like bad low calorie salads and stuff. <laughs> that's not going to work. Of course, it's not going to work. Your willpower is going to run out and that's why all the diets fail and everyone's, you know, sick. So yep. <laughs> if you find a way, that's why I'm like, okay, let's find a way where you don't have to use willpower and you're going to be successful. And my way of eating requires no willpower anymore. I have no desire to go get a burrito anymore. <laughs> I used to. I mean, you know, I don't know yeah. how many, a couple of years ago, it's like, ah, I just played beach volleyball. Like I can get a burrito like once in a while. I actually yep. don't, it's 0% on my radar anymore. Yeah. Not yeah. I, I set up the same thing for my nutrition as well. So I, I live in an entrepreneur house with a couple of my buddies and we hired a chef and the chef just prepares like basically 
organic grass fed paleo meals and he he makes meals tw- three times a week four meals at a time so basically each person has monday through saturday covered for for lunch and dinner and sunday we're on our own and breakfast you're on your own so no matter what six days a week i'm eating super clean and i have highly nutritious food that's like very fresh and i don't have to think about my diet you know i might have to adjust the calories and the macros a little bit if i want to gain weight or put on muscle or lose weight or whatever but uh, a lot of the decision making fatigue is is gone so but I've left in some room for some potential variability, aka breakfast and Sunday, so that I don't feel like I'm just you know mm-hmm. in, in a system, right? Just doing the same thing over and over again. And then the, he cooks varieties of food, so that has made it effortless for number one, my diet to be really dialed in, but then also for me to hit my meal timing because mm-hmm. I always have a, a a meal that's ready and made, you know, for the most part. Mm-hmm. So that's that's been a big hack for me too. That's cool. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty consistent with my meals too, and that's why I yeah I plan this podcast at a certain time so I could be done and eat at yes. a certain time. I and respect that. Well, go back to your so your discipline part where your discipline doesn't require discipline, uh, and with sleep specifically. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of you know a, a greater meta conversation when it comes to anything like this could be nutrition or sleep or or anything health related comes back to the identity. And that is the Archimedes lever that if you pull, then it makes everything else easier. And what I mean by identity is we behave in accordance with who we believe we are. And if you want to make real long-term behavioral change and change who you are, then you have to change who you are. So how do you do that? Well, you start with what you believe, right? And really taking some time to evaluate what is your relationship to sleep? What are your beliefs about sleep? How do you think sleep works? And how do you relate to sleep? Most people, they don't have a great relationship with sleep from what I've seen. Uh, And my relationship with sleep is incredible. And just, I'm going to say that again so, so you can hear, really hear it. My relationship with sleep is incredible. That's a belief that I have. And because I believe that, it influences all my behavior and all my action and all my results. I'll tell I'll just I'll just spew off some of my beliefs about sleep so that you can get a broader understanding or picture. I love sleep. Sleep loves me. It's so easy to get good sleep. I always get good sleep. No matter where I am, I can fall asleep easily and I always sleep through the night. I get three plus hours of deep sleep every single night and around 90 minutes to two hours of REM sleep. I sleep completely undisturbed and I feel so good about doing my wind down routine. I love doing my wind down routine. It's, it's actually insane how easy it is to get such incredible sleep. These are things that I believe. And by nature of believing these things, I create it in my world. And there's no willpower for me to think about getting good sleep, it just happens. (laughs) And it happens because of how I believe and interface with it. And I make certain decisions subconsciously without thinking about it because of those beliefs that will get me good sleep. And so there's no willpower. It's just an identity. You know, like for me to, and a, a really tangible example is like, there's no willpower for me to resist smoking cigarettes. Yeah. I don't smoke cigarettes. I will never smoke cigarettes. That's, I don't have, uh, like, that's just not something I'm available for, you know? And so uh, some of the work that I do with people and that I teach is changing their relationship to sleep. Because when you change what you believe and what your identity is, then the behavior change and the actions and the necessary things to do are automatic. You don't have to think about it. They just happen. It's beautiful. It's I, I've come to realize this. You can have all the information in the world about what to eat, but you need to change your beliefs before it's actually going to work. And you, you, some people can fake it and they just force it. And maybe they do a diet for a month and then they like go on some trip and then they're done. But if you believe I am a healthy person, what would a healthy person do? Right. Or I am now someone who eats well. What would and then it informs all your decisions. It's 
this is like the hugest life hack ever. And you can apply it to anything, sleep, nutrition, whatever. I think this is the the place that mo- like where most PhDs and like I don't know researchers and doctors they kind of like missed a mark on the human element of this, right? It's like you need to address the psychology if you want the change, and change also only comes with commitment. And so the game is not about the tactic or the strategy, although although you do need those. The game is is right here. And how can you align yourself with what you know is best for you? Because humans are self destruction machines, and there's this these two versions of ourselves that exist within us. The one that does the things that they know that they're supposed to be doing and that are best for them, and the ones that do the things that are self-destructive. And every day we get to wage that war within ourselves and we get to decide who wins. But I'd like to set it up set it up for an unfair advantage for this guy who is doing the right things. And I do that by really building that identity and working with my psychology to make sure that I'm not working against myself. Because you could do certain things for a certain period of time and then you fall off the wagon, then you get back on, then you fall off. And it's like, this is the yo-yo, the cyclical thing. So how do you get something to really embody this identity and, and live it out for the rest of their lives? Because that's, 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 that's where the result is really going to come from. It is. Well, you need that lasting change. It's a, it's a lifestyle, not a diet. It's the same type of thing. Wow. Okay. So that's part sometimes that might take some more coaching with people sometimes you know that's not automatic do you have any tips before we move on of how people can change their identity yeah so um i'll give you guys an exercise that you can do so take out your journal or your phone um and open up your notes and i want you to just write down what do i believe about sleep what is my relationship to sleep And when you start to see what comes onto the paper, just free, free, free write. Don't don't think about it. Just write what comes. And when you start to do this, it's going to reveal maybe some not supportive beliefs. And when you see those beliefs, I want you to look at them, and I want you to then write right next to it, each belief. When did I form this belief? And then after that, why? Is this not true? And what's the new belief I want to create and install that's more supportive of where I'm trying to go? And then write down the new belief. Once you have that list of new beliefs, I want you to open up GarageBand or voice notes on your phone and record yourself saying these new beliefs. Then you're going to listen to that recording every day for the next 21 days. See, the subconscious can only be influenced through two things, heightened emotion or repetition. So we form beliefs in our life when there's an experience that anchors in that belief, either good or bad. It could be high, it could be really low. Or something happens and boom, we, we decide this is the way that the world is. And in order to change that, we need to Groove neurologically, repattern that new way of thinking, that new way of belief. Because a belief is just a communication, it's just the communication between the synapses, right? Of that neurological connection is just like, it's like firing and wiring, firing and wiring. And so we can change that by repeating a new connection that we want to create. And as we start to make this new change, what happens is beliefs start to change, then actions start to change, then results start to change, and the results we can use as feedback to support these new beliefs. So we start at the beliefs, but then the actions start to happen. And as the actions start to happen, then we start to get the results and that feedback makes that concrete for us. So at first, it's like, hey, I'm telling myself, hey, I love sleep. It's so easy to fall asleep, even when it's not. But by nature of telling yourself that, you will start to change your behavior. And it doesn't have to be hard. 
You just have to do that one little thing and you can start to change it. But rarely do we take the time to do the introspection, the reflection, figure out what is the belief that's really driving my life and my behavior. And when we uncover that, then we can choose a new one. And if you have some really, uh, let's call them, if you have some really like heavy sort of beliefs or some really, call them sticky, smushy beliefs around sleep, then maybe it takes a little bit longer. Maybe it takes six weeks. Maybe it takes 12 weeks. But over time, your beliefs will start to change. And by nature of that, your behavior will start to change. And by nature of that, your sleep will start to change. Good tip. I like the actual nature. Hopefully, people have just press pause and do that. And 21 days, is that sort of a, a lower barrier to like habit change? Yeah. So it's something that I got from hypnotherapy. So um, that is the timeline in which people who study in hypnotherapy say that it actually takes time to change the belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So you talked about your, your daily routine in the morning, but what was your daily routine at night or what do you call the wind down routine? Yeah. So I have a very simple wind down routine. Simple is sustainable. Repeat after me. Simple is sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people, they try to, do a million different habits and things and and ultimately they end up hurting their self-esteem because they don't follow through on this crazy routine. So I, I wanted to create something for people that was really easy. So what I do is I walk in or the lights turn red at 8 30. Then you know I put I start to shut down, put the phone away, do that kind of stuff. It's a really big deal. And uh, we can circle back to the to the phone in a little bit. We'll talk about that. And I do a cool shower. And the reason why I do a cool shower is because when you take a hot shower or a hot bath, it brings up your blood sugar. And your blood sugar is dramatically going to impact your sleep. Okay. So if you wake up between the hours of three and five consistently, and it's like, boom, up, I'm awake and I can't go back to sleep, that's blood sugar dysregulation because your blood sugar is dropping cortisol is then dumped to regulate that blood sugar. And that's why when you're awake, you're like wide awake. If you're also tired, but wired where you can't like turn off the monkey mind, that also could be related to blood sugar, not necessarily, but it could be. So I don't want to do anything that's going to bring up my blood sugar later in the, in the day. So after I eat my last meal, ideally between three to five hours before bed, and I, you know, go for my 20 minute walk, then you know, lights turn red at 8.30. I'm going to take my cool shower. That's going to neutralize my blood sugar. It's going to bring it down. Not a cold shower like Wim Hof status, but just a cool shower that's a little bit uncomfortable. And I'm going to do something to connect to my body and I'm going to do something to get out of my head. So what that looks like for me, simple mind-body practice, kind of like gentle yoga. It's called dojo or priming. My good friend, Skip Kelly, shout out to Skip. He, um, that's his modality that he created. I do that every night. It's a way for me to connect with my body. And then I meditate for 20 to 30 minutes. That downregulates my system, gets me in a full parasympathetic. And then, you know, I brush my teeth. I take magnesium, the right type of magnesium, natural stacks, MagTech has three different types of magnesium, magnesium glycinate, magnesium taurate, magnesium three and eight. And if you want a discount, you can use my code. You get 50% off Kyle got camera for if anyone wants to try it. I love MagTech. I've been using it for years. Third party tested every single batch. And uh, yeah, open source transparency policy with their supplements. It's really great. I take that magnesium. Then I get in my bed. I turn on a 15 minute audiobook story. And I do some nose, nose breathing as I pass out, you know. Um, and if my, if my girlfriend's around, then I'll hang with her, just spend time with her. And that's my evening routine. It takes about an hour. So if I do go out, my 20 minute morning routine, or so if I do go out, my 20 minute evening routine is just a condensed version of what I just explained. So I'll come home right into my perfect sleep oasis. Everything's all red. I'll pop some MagTech magnesium. I'll take a cool shower. I'll do 10 minutes of dojo, 10 minutes of meditation, and then I'll go upstairs and I'll go to bed. And I fall asleep easily and I stay asleep and it's great. That's great. It's good to know. And then the 
waking up in the middle of the night is a big thing. We got to get back to that. I mm-hmm. used to struggle with that. I think there's multiple reasons for it, but I know blood sugar is a huge reason. Mm-hmm. Right? That's a huge reason. And I even saw in a CGM that, yes, during... And I don't know if it's worse if people do more keto diets, if you can have worse problems with middle of the night blood sugar. I think that was happening to me. Yeah. And I started eating more whole food carbs for the past couple of years, which I talk about, and I've gotten much better sleep. So yeah, go into that. Yeah. Yeah. There's 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 a couple of things to think about when you're waking up in the middle of the night. There's like a decision making tree that I'm thinking about. And I'm actually gonna be putting this inside of my my training, which is like start the first thing I start with is stress. Okay. So if you're waking up, evaluate, you know, your stress levels. Second thing is blood sugar. So how how much do your people know about like blood sugar? How how deep can I go into oh. that? I'd say advanced. Okay. So, so basically if your blood sugar is on a bit of a roller coaster throughout the day, then the chances of you waking up in the middle of the night or having sleep disturbances is way higher. And if you eat late and you don't go for that walk and you have a high carbohydrate meal or you have insulin resistance and you don't, and you don't tolerate carbohydrates very well, then that's really going to impact your sleep a lot because of the blood sugar. And so that's why the early early dinner is such a big deal and the evening walk is really powerful is because it helps to modulate and regulate that blood sugar. But then also something that you can use as a tool is something that I learned recently which is eating your veggies, then your protein, then your carbs, which will blunt the blood sugar spike by potentially up to 70%. Or you can take some apple cider vinegar with your food, which will also help with the blood sugar. There's a lot of little hacks that you can do to regulate that, but it's it's kind of this like situation that's tough because when your blood sugar is dysregulated, it's hard to sleep, and when it's hard and when you're not getting ideal sleep, then your blood sugar is more dysregulated. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so it's kind of this like this downward spiral that you need to you need to like stop it. And get back into upward momentum because when you're sleeping better, then you're you're you can tolerate uh, more carbohydrates and you can have sta- more stable blood sugar. So, how do you break this cycle if you're really stuck? Well, something that you can do. This is not a long term solution, but something that you can do that's that might help if you're really going through a stressful period and your blood sugar is dysregulated or something's happening health wise that um, you're you're getting a handle on is you can do. A protein snack 20 minutes before bed, 20 to 30 minutes before bed. You can just do like not a lot, but just like a couple bites of protein, just protein. That'll stabilize your blood sugar and you should be able to sleep through the night. And then hopefully you can get into an upward spiral with that now that you're sleeping through the night. One of the reasons why it's so important to move your meals earlier in the in the um in the evening, if you can is because of something called the glymphatic system, which is like the, the lymphatic system in your brain. So the glymphatic system is like removes toxins. So th- that's what's happening in your brain as well through the glymphatic system. And so when you shift that that um, dinner earlier, then your brain has time to clear out all the waste in your mind. And this is one of the variables that was making me feel so tired, even though I was sleeping eight to nine hours, I was eating too close to bed. The further I moved my uh, my dinner time away from my bedtime, the more refreshed and awake and alert I felt when I woke up. So, if you like to fast, if you if you're already into the fasting lifestyle, then I I would invite you to maybe consider shifting your fasting window to just going through the night um, and just moving your your dinner time earlier. That's been a huge hack for me. I. I really like eating an early dinner. It's not as socially acceptable, you know, but um, but that's that's one of the sacrifices that I make because of how much better it makes me feel when I wake up. Um, to to dig into the blood sugar a little bit more, it's or the waking up, I should say, is the other things to look at is temperature. So if you're too hot or you're too cold, that could be a reason for waking up. And so that's why I have the eight sleep mattress here that is thermoregulated and I have a completely temperature controlled house. I sleep very cool. Um, and I, that's why I take the cool shower as well. And 
all those things will help with core body temperature and that that is a big factor in how, how 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 much quality of sleep you get. And the other thing to consider with sleep disturbances is, is, I think, tension in the body. So a lot of people carry tension. I mean, if you work out, you probably carry tension in your body. If you're stressed, you carry tension in your body. Um, and we all just have tension for different reasons. And if you're uncomfortable in your body, like something's really tight or you're really sore, then or you're in pain, then that can be a really big indication um, of of something that might be attributing to you waking up. And the other thing to think about as well that I think often goes overlooked is uh, stimulant, especially caffeine. So caffeine will definitely attribute to sleep disturbances. And everyone, you know, loves their coffee. They love their tea, all that stuff. Hey, I get it. But if you slept the way that I slept, you probably wouldn't need the coffee or the tea. Um, and you'd actually have more energy. That's a yeah, tough pill to swallow for some, maybe me. <laughs> or at least stop the, stop the coffee at a certain hour. There's a half-life of caffeine, right? Yeah, and it's five hours, five-hour half-life, I think. Yeah, something like that. So... You have to end it pretty early to still do okay. I have small amounts of caffeine into the afternoon, but I've never sort of done a test where maybe I could just sleep better. I, I seem to sleep fine. I fall asleep very quickly. I used to have a huge problem going to sleep for my whole life. Mm. Take me sometimes an hour. I have all these sleep problems. Now, it because it, I listen to podcasts before I go to sleep is is my one thing that I still need because it takes my mind. I think my I'm thinking about too many things. I have too many businesses, too many ideas, and I can't <laughs> yeah. turn my mind off. So I have to listen to someone else. But it's five minutes. It's incredible. Um, like it's usually four to seven minutes. I fall asleep because I go back and go where I left off in the podcast, and it's always surprisingly little how I got through this podcast because I fall asleep so fast. Yeah, that's why I do the stories. Uh, you know, on audiobook too. For me, yeah, it just occupies my mind while I'm sort of like getting into that relaxed state while I'm in bed. And let's I can get caught up in the story versus caught up in the own, my own story in my head. <laughs> yeah, if it's too good. Yeah, I don't listen to really good podcasts because I've done that and then I've just stayed awake because the podcast was so good. Yeah. Oh, I want to I want to talk about talk about this actually. So this is this has been the biggest discovery that I made in um in the last year and it's all about this thing, right? The phone and what I learned about the phone and about neurotransmitters um, that really impact sleep a lot is the relationship between dopamine and serotonin. So dopamine is this neurotransmitter, neuromodulator, however you want to say it, that is the activated feeling to yeah, let's make it happen. Let's let's go do it. Let's it's this chasing sort of stimulated. It's not bad. It's just that's it's just a sympathetic. You know, if you're talking about the the nervous system, we have the sympathetic, which is fight or flight, and you have the the uh, parasympathetic, rest and digest. So it's a sympathetic sort of feeling, which is a little stress. Okay, a good stress, but it can be overstressed. And when dopamine goes up, serotonin comes down. And so there's this inverse relationship between dopamine and serotonin. And serotonin is the neurotransmitter, neuromodulator that makes you feel relaxed, makes you feel at ease, makes you feel at peace, content, and like all is well in the world. And it's come to my attention that everyone or most everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people are very overstimulated with dopamine. And they're spent, you only have so much dopamine or serotonin in any given day, it replenishes in the night. And when you're really high dopamine driven and you're spending it on cheap dopamine, aka the phone, it puts you into this reactive stress state, which will then mess with your blood sugar a little bit. And also most of the serotonin in your body is in your gut. And so when serotonin goes down, then motility also is affected. And so this can impact your gut health. And uh, we all know that gut health is a huge, there's huge ramifications for your health and and basically everything, your happiness, all of it. And if you feel overstimulated, if you feel like it's hard to wind down, if you feel like you're never really fully rested or you don't have the energy you want, it could be potentially because you're you're 
spending all your dopamine and you're driving the baseline dopamine down and you're not getting enough serotonin you're not experiencing that feeling of contentment and at ease and peace that you get when you're in a high uh, serotonin state and the reason why i noticed this is because i had a one-on-one client who came to me he's like hey kyle i uh, i haven't slept well in seven years i've been to multiple sleep studies uh they diagnosed me sleep apnea blah 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 and i've tried everything underneath the sun We got on our first call and I I do this thing called a lifestyle audit. And I look at just like, how do they spend their time? And one of those things that I look at is how are they spending time on their phone? And this guy was spending 12 hours a day on his phone. So his screen time was 12 hours and on all these different apps. And I said, we're not gonna change anything until we get the screen time down. So I want you to delete all these apps. I want you to bring your screen time down by at least half. So I want you to go from 12 hours to six hours minimum. That was the first thing we did. So all we did was just bring his screen time down, delete these apps. And the first night he slept completely through the night. And he says, I don't remember the last time I slept this well. So it's, I think it's a real problem that we're facing, it's almost an epidemic of overstimulation. And um, one of the the things that I talk about that I, I'm going to preach, I'm going to die on this hill, is to download an app called Opal, which will block you out of everything, text messages, social media, email, all of it. And you can put schedules in where you're allowed to go in and you're allowed not to go in. And you can't, like, you can't break it. You can't go, you can't go in if you don't want to. And and just watch how much opens up in your life and how much easier it is to fall asleep and how much deeper asleep you get when you're not overstimulating yourself. That's a good tip. Even just doing things, not even to do with sleep, of going to, I'll, I'll use a dinner party again last night. Not one person opened their phone during this dinner party. Hmm. It wasn't like we decided to do it. We were having such a fun time, such good discussion, all this stuff. And just people are mindful and they get it, you know? Yeah. No one opened their phone. Huge difference. You walk around town, you can go to look at a restaurant and there's like five people on their phone. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. Yeah. So I, I, it's like, it's, it's things like this that I think have really helped me get people better results and really like create a massive, massive change in my own life and results for, for me of just going beyond what the biology is telling us and looking more at the human element of what actually is impacting the person and how can we augment different things in our life, whether it's our environment or whether it's where we're spending our time, aka the phone, um, or our beliefs that are also going to impact you know, what we're doing and how we're feeling and, and the results that we're getting. Well, yeah. And to go just to hit this a little more, this is probably not new information to people, but just how much better experience in life you have with, if you're not looking at your phone, it's, I mean, this night was incredible because we were just connecting. We were in deep conversation. People don't understand. I mean, maybe this will help people just reiterate it in their head because it's not new information. You're not going to have a good experience if you're just on your phone, but it's just needs to be repeated. It's like, there's a whole different ball game. Every time you look at your phone, you're just disconnected. You just jump out of the conversation. You jump out of the experience and beyond sleep. It's just going to help your human experience. I mean, I have a problem using my phone during the day, but it, I mean, I, I do, it's not like I'm trying to have a social interaction. You know, I, I, I am getting stuff done on my phone, right? But what I've learned more recently is how to have that time that I'm not gonna look at my phone. And it's like, you force yourself. Like, yes, there's this awkward moment where I could look at my phone and then I'll feel less awkward or it'll fill the time or just don't do it. It's like, if I can't do it, now I'm gonna be like, it, I have to go talk to someone, you know, say you're in a social event. If you force yourself to, if it's not an option, then you can't 
use it as a crutch to just look at your phone and look like you're busy. You have to go talk to someone and then you can meet someone. Yeah. And this comes back to the conversation around setting up systems to make it it effortless, which I'm all about, you know, again, r- reminder, I'm a lazy guy, right? Or I was a lazy guy and, or I'm not as disciplined as people think. That's a better way of saying it Yeah, is I downloaded this app that works so that I don't have to think about it. It just does the job for me. Because I'm a human, you know, I have flaws and I'm, I am fall to temptation and I have that primal animal brain, just like all of us. And, and I want to set myself up for success. So I just, I put in backstop so that I don't fall back on old patterns. That's a good tip. So we've covered a lot. We need to figure out what, what else have we not covered? Actually, I'll, I'll, what I was most interested in is you pushing back your circadian rhythm and it's Mm -hmm. still working, which I'm glad to hear because I just naturally have this later cycle. So if I get everything else down correctly and I do all the things, I can push it back and still get good sleep. So that's good to hear. But what else have we not covered and what are some other, you know, big points you want to leave people with? I don't think it can be, understated like you know we outlined a couple things here which is a circadian rhythm right so the 80 20 of of this all is the circadian rhythm and the 80 20 of the circadian rhythm is going for that 20 to 30 minute morning walk and then we also talked about the environment right building a sleep oasis and then we also talked about having an evening routine using your senses to to down regulate let's 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 we can unpack that a little bit so maybe you have a diffuser right and you put some lavender in it or a certain specific scent that you like that feels relaxing. And you put that in your bedroom or you put that in your kitchen or you put that somewhere in your home. And you use that as like an anchor. And it's like, okay, when I turn on my diffuser, that signals to my system that, hey, it's time to get ready for sleep. Then you, you know, the lights go red. So visually you're seeing, okay, this is changing. It's time to get ready for sleep. Then you take a cool shower. And so physically, uh, kinesthetically, you're, you're like, oh, it's, it's time to get ready for sleep. And then you do some type of activity that gets you out of your head and, um, and connects with your body. Because, you know, if we're using our cognitive load throughout the day, and it's like, we have all these racing thoughts, like you said, it's like, how do we, how do we just quickly get out of that? And, you know, some people feel differently about like, I just work, do what works for me. But there might be other things that could work for other people. I know people really like NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. That could be hypnosis or or yoga nidra or something like that. Just some simple practice. doesn't have to take long. It could be five minutes where it's just like you're reconnecting with yourself. I also like to plan my day the night before. I'll admit that this is not something I'm super consistent with anymore. I used to be religious with it. I would love to be more consistent with it. But I what I found is just by simply planning out my day the night before, I take all that noise that's in my head mm. and I get it on the paper. Mm-hmm. And it I just map out, hey, what am I focused on tomorrow? What are the things I need to get done? And I just write that out and I put that in the schedule. And just by nature of doing that, my mind is so much more clear and so much more relaxed. And I think maybe what a part of my message that has slowly been emerging over over the years of like figuring this stuff out is that it really can't be as simple as you want it to be and i i want to i want to let people know that that's a reality because you're talking to a guy who spent a fortune on his own personal health thinking that it was going to be complex and thinking that there was all these different things that um, that are just impossible to maintain to get the result. And the conclusion that I'm coming to is that it really doesn't matter if you just do some simple things. Because more important than all the tactics and the strategies and all this stuff is that you're happy and fulfilled. So something that I'm beginning to start preaching too is like, hey, all this sleep optimization in the world, is it going to save you from 
a job that you hate or a partner that isn't right for you or a toxic you know family situation or whatever the stress or external st- or you know your money problems whatever your stressor is you got to address that more importantly and when the emotional body is super happy and fulfilled it's like dude getting good sleep is you don't you actually don't really have to do anything like when you're on vacation you just you just fall asleep and it's easy and you sleep for hours and it's the most rejuvenating sleep and why is that well it's because you're relaxed you're usually pretty happy you're enjoying yourself you're usually outside you're usually with people you love and you're usually having a good time and so if you pair all those things together that's the recipe for getting a good night's rest and you'll naturally just go to bed when you're tired even if you're having more fun than you would normally have if you're drinking if you're you know staying out later it's like you can kind of get away with a lot more when you're having a good life and so i don't want people to make the same mistake that I did, which is get so obsessed with this stuff that they forget to live and and live a good life, live a fulfilled life. If this stuff makes you happy, if this stuff makes you fulfilled, if this stuff gives you the juice, then by all means, like make it your life. And if there's other things you care about, you know, make sure to put that in there too, right? And and don't forget about that stuff. Yeah. This is good. The mental side is important. Some, sometimes you could be doing it all correct, but then you still have that sort of anxiety or some weird thing that you're obsessed with that's going to make you not go to sleep or not stay asleep. So that's got to be addressed as well. And one tip for that, actually, that it's kind of similar to what you said about planning your day. What I found, I mean, it's not like we're going to solve everyone's problems in their whole life and what they have anxiety about and all this stuff. But one thing is to write things down, like do a brain dump of all the things you're thinking about. And, and also just leave your room. Also your rooms for sleeping. Yeah. You know, that's another one I've heard. And if you're, if you're having trouble fall asleep, okay, go into the living room, right? Leave your room, be like, okay, I'm, I got to reset. I'm going to write down all the things I'm worried about, all the things that I need to do, get it out of my head. All right. They're on paper. They're done. Now I'm going to go back and go to sleep. It's done. I can't do anything at this time at night. I'm not going to get any of these things done. I'm not going to solve these. I wrote them down. I'm not going to forget them now. You know, maybe it's like, okay, I got my checklist and I'm good. And that's <laughs> worked for me. And I'm like, okay, then I fall asleep. Yeah. And, and I think, I think we know all these, we know not all of them, but we know some people who there's, there's so focused on being healthy that they're almost making themselves sick with trying to be healthy. And I think it's a slippery slope, right? Where you're trying to optimize and trying to do the best you can. But at some point, you just got to hit the 80-20, you know, and be like, this is good. I believe it's good. I'm a human. Humans are programmed to sleep well. It's in our biology. It's in our nature. It's our body knows exactly what to do. We just need to get the things that are in the way of getting good sleep. And and that, that is also something that I teach is, is getting results via negativa, all right? So that means getting results by removing things. So instead of trying to add more stuff to your plate, what can you remove in order to make that happen? So what does that normally look like? What's the low-hanging fruit? The obvious ones, alcohol, weed, stimulants, porn, screens. That's it. You know, late dinner, late dinner, right? Like that. those are the big ones. Like if you just... All you did was you got rid of all those things, then I bet it would be pretty hard to not fall asleep easily and stay asleep. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and here's another one that uh, for some people, okay, you're t- you're kind of talking to people who are already trying to get all the best sleep and get the eight hours. Mm-hmm. I have a big one for people that some of them they're just oh man, I can do six hours, I'm fine. I can do five hours, I'm fine. I read the, you know, how, what is it? Uh, Matthew Walker's book, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why, we, Why sleep. we Sleep. Yeah. Yeah. There is a vanishingly small amount of people that are genetically gifted that don't need a good eight hours of sleep. Most people need a good eight hours of sleep. So, my number one thing I let people know is get your eight hours of sleep. You got to <laughs> make time for it. You know, yeah. Some people aren't making time for it, it's not a priority in their life. And they can try to do all these other things, but if they're not, allowing themselves to get in bed eight and a half hours before they have to wake up, 
then they're screwed from the start. And I'll ask you, what, and this is actually something someone asked in the mastermind, which is a great question. And we have another mastermind we're in. Uh, convince me why I need to get eight hours of sleep. Why do I need to take it seriously? <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. Why? And that's a good one because if you take it seriously, if you're like, hey, this is life or death, then you will do it. Right? That's what motivated this gentleman that was going to get him to do it is if the stakes were high. So yeah, I, I, I think it's super important to, to just address that. And yeah, I think I also got it from Matthew Walker that um, he was asked a question and he looked at all the research, all the studies, and all that stuff um, around, you know, can people operate with, you know, sub six hours of sleep? And his answer was like, there's absolutely no research that shows that anyone can do that. <laughs> there's like, there's like no literature to support that at all. So, uh, and then in his book, he goes into detail about if you're sleeping less than like, you know, five hours a night, then, you know, you're at risk for serious disease, you know? Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer, heart, heart disease, diabetes, like basically every single health problem you could think of that people die from start getting worse when you start subtracting more and more sleep. And sleep, it, the reason why I landed on sleep as a thing that I started to you know, talk about publicly uh, is number one is because the thing that I started to get results with the fastest, um, but really it's so within your control and it impacts everything. So sleep is when your body heals. Deep sleep is when your body heals. REM sleep is when your mind heals. It's going to regulate your blood sugar. It's going to uh, it's going to regulate your hormones, and it's going to uh, improve your gut health. And it's going to improve your cognition, your focus, your sex drive, your ability to uh, to think and make decisions. So on, so on, so on, so on. I mean, I could just go on and on and on and on. And that's why I think it's sleep is actually, when you do it this way, it's the natural limitless pill because it, it can enhance everything that you're already doing. And I remember one time, just a quick story is uh, I got a 99 sleep score, basically a perfect, perfect night of sleep. And I was on a sales call with, with um, a potential partner that I was going to be working with. And I could hear in his tonality so what I started noticing is that there were some questions beneath the questions and I could sort of read between the lines. It was almost like I was seeing through the matrix and I could kind of see what was happening before it was happening, like time was slowing down. And what I realized is he not only wanted to work with me as, as a partner, but he also wanted me to enroll him as a client. And I could just feel that underneath what he was saying. And I feel like I could only sense that because of how dialed in I was how how present how like my brain was working at at like a next level capacity because I could feel what was underneath the communication and I was attuning to that and I picked up on that almost subconsciously and I could only do that because my brain was operating at such a high high degree of um, of concentration and I think that's what's available for people when they really start to go full tilt with this kind of stuff and it just it, it's not even about like if you don't do this stuff, then you know you're you're at risk for disease and and the, all the bad stuff. But it's also like, what are you missing out on from a human experience possibility perspective? Like, how much of your potential are you leaving on the table because you're not fully rested and recovered and rejuvenated? And my biggest fear, Brian, is that I don't actualize my fullest potential, and that scares the hell out of me. And I want to do everything I can to be all that I can be and give all that I can give for my entire life. And and that's why I'm so motivated to do it. And I, I don't understand why people want to ever feel less than they could. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I want for myself and that's what I want for others. Mm, that's beautiful. Tell me your testosterone score you got after doing this. Yeah. So, as you know, it's funny. I haven't talked about this publicly, um, but recently I, I tested all my hormones and um, my testosterone was 1100. Uh, and I'm 29 years old, and um, and yeah, that's 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 what it was. At. The normal the normal range people are in like 300 to 700 or something. It's something yeah. not very good. Yeah, it's around it's around that 300 to 600, 300 to 700. Yeah, so I'm I'm almost double the quote unquote normal range, and it's still within a healthy range. It's not like too much, 
Um, and I'll let you, but the audience know, I'll let you know, I can feel it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> and my girlfriend can feel it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to have that level of drive. And um, for all the men out there who are struggling with their testosterone, I know this is a huge epidemic. Uh, 90, I think 95% of your endogenous um, growth hormone is basically taking place when you sleep. So part of the reason why I think my testosterone is so high is because I have such high deep sleep. Um, and that's what I would attribute to years of just getting really high quality sleep for a very, very, very long time. Maybe we should have led with this. <laughs> Maybe yeah. Maybe that I'll, can be the hook. Maybe that could be the hook. the hook. Now I'll patch it in the intro as well. I'll, I'll do a little intro before this episode and, and tee you up a little bit. Yeah. And you also have a sleep program and yes. I checking it out. So it's, it's really cool. Tell people more about the program. Yeah. So it's called the Sleep Advantage. And it's specifically designed for entrepreneurs and high performers who want to optimize their sleep to increase their performance, their energy, their focus, and grow their business ultimately. Because these types of people, their livelihood, everything that they do, it's it's all about the most protecting the most important asset. And the most important aspect is their mind, their thinking and their physical body's capacity. So whether they're a professional athlete or an entrepreneur or or someone who or or an entrepreneur or someone who just wants to perform at a high level, it's like you can't do that if you're not sleeping well. And there's a big difference between getting good sleep and getting the type of sleep that I'm talking about. Because this is not just getting a solid eight hours. This is like an unfair advantage. And that's why I call it the sleep advantage. And so I put together a free training that uh special for people that just listen and watch to for your your show and it's at sleepadvantage.co uh, slash sapien and there's a training and in their training i break down what i'm going to be teaching how how it works and then also uh if they want to go deeper then they can check out the course as well cool so that's sleepadvantage.co slash sapien mm-hmm. yep that's great yeah man um so yes, the link that Kyle is saying needs an HTTP colon backslash backslash www.thentheSleepAdvantage.co slash sapien. It's a long domain. Just click the link in the show notes instead of trying to type it out. But it's weird how it doesn't work unless you put the HTTP with the colon and the www. So just click through the show notes. I think it's great. I've, I've seen some of the videos and you just break it down. It's like everything you need and nothing more. That's what I I saw from it. Cause it's like, yeah, you could give them some like 20 hour thing and you got to do all this and that, and then no one's going to watch it. But if you just give them what they need, then they're going to do it. It's actionable. You have all the experience. You've done it. You have the results. The proof is in the pudding. So that's great. And yeah, what just one. No- what, yeah. One note on that is like, it's like I spent so much money, you know, $150,000 more or more time, energy, years, just figuring this stuff out. And when I was thinking about the course, I just, I, I wanted to create a course that creates results and testimonials and creates transformation, not a, not something that people just get and consume. And I had to think about what is actually going to remove as much friction as possible. So I aggregated and I amalgamated basically all that stuff that I learned into the simplest, easiest, most digestible, like actionable steps so that I can like walk someone through the process of how to transform their sleep and start performing at the highest level almost immediately if they wanted to execute. And it's been really powerful for me to put that out there because, you know, some of the people who have sent back some testimonials, it's like I had this woman who she was an insomniac and it was taking her five to six hours a night to fall asleep, which is insane to even say out loud. And now she falls asleep in 18 minutes. And then I had another guy who was a coffee addict and he was drinking five to six cups a day and was not like sleeping three or four hours a night. And now he doesn't drink coffee at all, except for once a week, just because he enjoys it. And he sleeps completely through the night. He sleeps like a baby and, and they're coming from all different walks of life. And so it's just, Honestly, it's really fulfilling to see all these people take what all this pain and suffering that I went through and and this realizations and this content that I've that I've created through that pain and to see them 
make the changes and to get the results so quickly, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, I haven't sat with it that much, but when I think about it, when I say it to you, it's kind of like, it moves me a little bit to realize that, that it's actually working and working really well. And the reason why this is also so close to home is because my brother, he, he had insomnia or he has insomnia and he's had it his entire adult life. And I never really put it together. It was like, wow, you have a sleep course and your brother had insomnia. It was like the subconscious thing of me just trying to like help my brother. And it's been really cool to see all these other people transform and get results. And, you know, when I was talking with you, Brian, about like, you know, in introducing these ideas to your people, it's like, what? what how could I enhance the experience of what I've learned even more? And I really thought about it. I was like, well, if people could just get their questions answered after they go through the course material, if there's anything else that they're struggling with, then I want to give them that access to me directly through this like private concierge. So it's like, if you go through the course material, then you can, and you still having issues, then you can reach out. And I set up this system where I'll get the email. I'll see what the question is with your sleep data. You got to send send in your sleep data with your question. And then I'll record a video answering that question. And then I'm going to put that into a new section inside of the course. And then I'm going to build out this catalog of people answering people's questions. So eventually I have every single question that anyone could ask about sleep answered and answered in a really thoughtful way and intentional way. And if I don't know the answer, then I'll find a researcher or I'll look into the literature, but um, I'm pretty convinced that we can solve almost any sleep issue if someone's willing to do the work. That's really cool. And it's great because the new people, like especially just, I don't know, sapient, well, it's peak human listeners, but sapiens, a code I use or just sort of <laughs> word I use a lot. So if you use the Sapien link or whatever, I don't know if there's a promo code or what, but you put in the Sapien, you'll be one of the first people and you get to use or, or get your questions answered personally. Yes, exactly. So yeah, anyone who uses that link, the sleepadvantage.co slash Sapien, you guys are going to be some of the first people to get access to that. So that means you'll get direct access to me and I'll actually answer your questions. Um, and that's a that's an amazing and beautiful thing. And that normally would cost a lot of money, a lot of money. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, it's really valuable. Good stuff. Well, I'm excited to try some new things. I've been trying to dial in my sleep. I've been focusing on it, but now I want to do more things to dial it in stuff. I've learned from you because I want the real deep sleep, the real REM sleep, and, uh, that can be measured. And I'm going to bust out that old ring I have and see, um, how I can improve. So. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for being a friend here in Austin and and living the life and like proving these things out with all your yeah, your basically experiments on yourself and check out your YouTube too. Kyle got camera on YouTube. Yeah, I got some great videos on YouTube just exploring different topics in the health space. youtube.com forward slash Kyle got camera. All right, man. Well, good stuff. I'll see you around soon, I'm sure. And uh take care, man. All right. Thanks for having me. Later, buddy.